Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz musician and educator Oran Etkin. He was born in Israel and moved to Boston at four, and these days he lives in New York City. He began piano at the age of five, violin at eight, saxophone at nine, and clarinet at 13. He then started studying with renowned saxophonist George Garzon at the age of 14 and later with the great Youssef Latif. Most recently, he released 2015's What's New, Reimaging Benny Goodman, and he is continuing to teach his music education program that was created 11 years ago and it's highly successful. It's called Timbalulu. He has delivered it to over 2,000 children in New York City, to kids in 23 countries, and has been endorsed by Hollywood heavies like Harvey Keitel, Naomi Watts, and Edie Falco teaching their children the same method so get to know this cat and dig this interview my friends or thank you for taking a little time out today i appreciate it yeah no problem thank you thanks for for having me absolutely so what i'm going to do is you are an inordinately busy man between your education and your performing you got a, a cd that came out last year re-imaging benny goodman so let me just start off at the top here i know you got a lot of action going on some touring coming up but give me an idea in your own words, kind of a snapshot of activity that's going on with you. Well, we've been uh, touring the new album, uh, What's New Reimagining Benny Goodman, touring it in Europe, here in the States. After the new year, I'll be uh, back in, in Europe and uh, at the Red Sea Jazz Fest in Israel as well, um, and then at the summer festivals. And uh, at the same time, I'm also uh, touring the, the Timbalulu Project, so giving concerts for kids. Um, you know, around the world, and also uh, developing the, the educational program back here in New York for Timbalulu. So you just have to have a suitcase packed all the time for the way you live your life, huh? Yeah, I mean, it, it ebbs and flows, but sometimes there's a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of craziness back and forth, traveling and stuff. But, you know, it, it goes with, sometimes it's it's really crazy, sometimes it's it's more calm. Right on. Well, let me ask you this, you know, for a cat like you that's so busy with so many levels of you know, performing an education, I always like to ask what the health of jazz in America and even the world in 2016 is. Seems to me it's pretty vibrant, rich, and there's a lot going on. But in your words, how is jazz doing as a healthy organism? Uh, well, musically, it's doing wonderfully. I think there's a lot of amazing uh, creative musicians, a lot of young voices that are adding um, their own unique voice to the music, and the music is developing and pushing and... and uh, really relevant to this moment in time. And then in terms of the industry and how it's, it reaches to the audiences, um, I think that always, you know, we're living in a difficult time economically for a lot of industries and uh, and music industry has all gone through a lot of changes and stuff. So I think it's a, it's a difficult time and there are challenges in, in building new audiences. Um, although I do see a lot of, of of young audiences, new, new people coming to the music, uh, which is great. You know, I think there's a lot of challenges in that realm, but musically, I think it's thriving as much as it ever has. You know, the great thing about the clarinet is from, as, as in a, you know, I don't play a musical instrument, a little bit on the drums, but I'm not proficient, you know, on the instrument. But when I see the clarinet live, it has to be one of the happiest sounds in the world. But when I speak to clarinet players, they always talk about how one note can throw you off, and there's all these superlatives and these ironies that go into the instrument, which I consider one of the happiest ones. What is it about the clarinet that not only lured you, but just keeps you fascinated all the time? Yeah, I mean, for, for me, it, it's, it's really like a human voice. You know, the, the saxophone is, 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 and I play tenor saxophone primarily, is kind of like a male voice, and the clarinet is, is like a child's voice, or like a... a you know, female voice, or, or really, a, it's like a child, and it and it's able to run so nimbly around and and uh, and express such a, such depth of character. It can really cry and be very melancholy, or it can be very playful. Um, so it's really, you know, such a an expressive instrument in my, in, in in the way I hear it. And speaking of this being an expressive instrument, you re who the world would consider a master on the instrument, Benny Goodman. Talk to me about this album. How did this album come about, and how have you felt about it now that it's out and the afterglow, so to speak? So I, I wanted to make an album that, that pays homage to Benny Goodman, uh, but doesn't try to recreate his music. For me, the music of Louis Armstrong and, and Benny Goodman and all the music of the, the 30s and stuff, 
really was a big part of my growing up. So, so when I pick up an instrument, it naturally is part of what I play. Uh, but I wanted to do something that, that honored him in a, in a very personal and natural way. So, um, you know, I got together this group with, with other like-minded musicians who, who also are able to, you know, at an instant go into that 1930s swing or go into something very present and very modern and go back and forth and, and, and really just do whatever the music calls for. So Matt Wilson on drums, you know, great swinging musician, but also great open player. Uh, Selvin Fortner on piano, uh, one of the great young voices from New Orleans who can play stride like, you know, second nature. Steve Nelson on vibes, really, you know, one of the top uh, vibes players around and, and the way he drives the rhythm with his lines is, is amazing. And then uh, we have Sharnay Wade, uh, my longtime friend and collaborator on uh, vocals. It's kind of, it, it, it's inspired by the, uh, band that Benny Goodman had in the 30s with Lionel Hampton, Teddy Wilson, and Gene Krupa. That same instrumentation. Beautiful. You know, I, I had the honor of interviewing Mr. Terry Gibbs recently, and he talked about how oh. Benny, Good, Benny Goodman called everybody Pops. I mean, the stories that he had about Benny were just beautiful, and he just called everybody Pops. He couldn't remember anybody's name, but he said when he got on that <laughs> bandstand, <laughs> he, was the, he, yeah. was the, he was the man. You know, he just, there was... There was a genius that went through it, but he couldn't remember people's names when he got off the bandstand. And it's, it's definitely it's cool. a character. I spoke with Terry as well when I was preparing for this album, and Terry oh, wonderful. told me some stories about him. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, everyone who's worked with him is uh, <laughs> just tells them very uh, very funny stories about about Benny Goodman's character. You know, I, I don't ever like to use the words child prodigy. It just kind of puts an ominous odor out there. But I do want to point out about you growing up. You started the piano at five, violin at eight, sax at nine, and clarinet at 13. It's probably safe to say that music was in your DNA. So give me an idea of where you grew up and what your family lineage was in your childhood to get to where you're at. Well, I was born in Israel, uh, but I moved when I was four to Boston. So I grew up in Boston. Yeah, there are no uh, professional musicians that I know of really in my family, except for distant aunts. Um, but, you know, my, my parents, my mom plays a little bit, little piano and sings in a choir. Uh, my dad doesn't play anything but loves music. And I think it's his his uh, his love for music, you know, singing around the house, singing in the car, always playing music and stuff, uh, you know, on the, on the radio and stuff. But just his love for melody. He's, he was always walking around singing melodies that I think really caught me. And then when I was nine years old and I heard Louis Armstrong for the first time, that's what really changed my life and I I became fascinated with Louis Armstrong I um my parents really encouraged me they they took me down to New Orleans uh, a few times and and I when I heard the music down there and then there was a uh, um a great tuba player down there named Tuba Fats who uh who was kind of the father of the of the uh funeral bands and the second line bands down there who kind of took me under his wing a little bit when I was a, you know a young kid down there so, it, you know, that whole ex experience of Louis Armstrong's music and New Orleans music really grabbed me into loving the the melody. And so, yeah, I don't think it was, uh, it was never anything that was pushed on me. It was always something that I, I personally loved to do. And, um, and my parents just encouraged me and gave me the opportunities to, to pursue it. Um, but they never really pushed me or, you know, or forced anything on me. Well, and it, you know, it's no surprise that you're such a good educator now and you've had such a great career. Your teachers have been George Garzon, Yusef Latif, Dave Liebman. Mm -hmm. You've stood on the shoulders of some pretty pretty hefty people in the world of jazz. What do you learn from these guys that's been so instrumental for you? You know, we, we talk about being a musician, but as a human being, too, what, what, what's been so key to them? You, you learn things that are much more subtle from being around these great masters than, than just, you know, the chords or, or the, the technicality of music, you learn how to how they ap approach life and how they approach their horn in the same natural way that they approach life. And Yusef Latif in particular, he was such a big-hearted individual. He he was all about learning his whole life. He, he he never stopped learning and never stopped listening to people. He was he was more of a listener than than anyone I know. And in, in, and I'm not talking about in music. I'm just talking about in life. When he met someone, he wanted to know who they were, he, and he would remember things that you told them, and and uh, and he was always curious. 
and then you take that to the music and you, uh, you know, the most important thing about music is listening. Uh, I remember when I was in high school, I, I was, I started studying with George Garzon when I was uh, 14 and my band director who, who was a drummer uh, told me that he felt the thing that made George Garzon great was that when you play with him, you have a feeling that he's really listening to you. And that makes you play a lot more, a lot better because you know that he's, he's there listening. So the power of that listening um, is, I think, the first thing that, that, that drives the music. You can, you can feel that element of listening. And that's why also the audience is, is part of the band because their listening changes what the music is going to sound like that particular day. I love that. I've, I've never heard that before. The, the one thing I do want to ask you, too, is you've been rather prolific in traveling. Indonesia, China, Japan, you know, Israel, Europe, and you've been at Jazz at Lincoln Center. I could go on and on. But let me ask you this. Did, did you ever get nervous? I'm sure in the beginning you got nervous, but do you ever still get nervous? What's your approach on stage now versus when you began? I don't really get nervous on stage or performing um, sometimes the logistics of a, of a tour or, you know, the travel and, and then the, you know, all the stuff that you need to keep in your mind and, and all that, sometimes that gets really overwhelming and I'm nervous to to mess something up in that sense. Just when I go on stage, it's, it's just about being honest and being in that moment and, and improvising with the audience and improvising with the musicians as long as I feel secure enough to and who I am, then I don't need to hold on to what I am in order to, you know, I don't need to hold on to any preconceived notion of what I am. I can just let it be in that moment, and I feel confident that whatever will come out will be will be whatever is fitting for that moment. So I find actually a lot of times the, the most uh, beautiful stuff comes out when there's the least preparation or when there's a new situation where you're, where you have to be on your toes and, and listening and there's nothing to fall back on. Uh, you know, a lot of times I, I love working with, with uh, traditional musicians in different countries where I go to and stuff like that where, you know, you don't know what's really going to happen. But a lot of times that leads to the best music. So let me ask you this. Another part of your life is being a teacher, and you've already mm -hmm. mentioned uh, Tim Ballou, 11 years ago, you come up with this approach. You've given it to about 2,000 children in New York City. You've been to 23 countries. Some of your clients have been Harvey Keitel, Naomi Watts, Edie Falco. What is it about this program? Talk to me a little bit about this, how it came about, and why it's been so effective. Well, I wanted to see if we can really teach music the same way that the kids learn a language at a young age. Because um, I think a lot of how we teach music is uh, is similar to how we teach a foreign language. We teach all the rules of music because rules are always easy to teach. So you teach all the rules of grammar to a child, and and then after two years, they can't really even speak fluently with a with a good accent and stuff. But you see little kids learning a language. They they don't know what it means to conjugate a verb, but they conjugate every verb perfectly. They just speak. You know, they they've internalized all the rules without even knowing that there are rules of how grammar works. So. I've seen that happen with music, with, with children who grow up around music. And I've also, you know, watched how different cultures teach music and how, um, you know, like, uh, for example, I work with a great um, Malian singer, a West African singer named Abdullah Jabate. And when his child was three years old, he could have gone on tour with us on the djembe. He was like a wonderful djembe player at three years old because he was playing the djembe before he was speaking. It was just his language. He would just go over to the gym and, and hit it, and, and there was there were rehearsals in the house all the time. He would come to all the shows as a baby. It just became part of his life. So I wanted to see if we can create a music program and a way of educating kids on a, on a bigger scale um, that can take this approach of learning music to kids uh, throughout New York and now expanding it you know, to kids all around the world. Uh, through this approach of Timbalulu. The other thing that I've noticed, too, is that you've been a part of Grammy Award-winning albums and you've gotten awards. And mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. What award have you received in your life that surprised you? Not your favorite one, but one that kind of validated you or got you in a way that you were like, wow, I didn't expect that. 
That's a good question. <laughs> I mean, awards are, are kind of a, a strange thing because they're harder to comprehend than, than a personal si- sign of appreciation. So in a way that, you know, when, I, when, a, when a child comes up to me and, and expresses some kind of attachment or something like that, because of they've seen a show or because they were in the classes or and they and that that kind of personal attachment or or somebody who came who came up to me um we played in Paris after uh in in June not this past year but the year before at the Paris Jazz Fest uh, the day after there was a, a a terrorist attack in the south of France and and I dedicated a, the encore to to that and somebody came and was crying uh, after the concert. We, we also did a piece that, about, that was based on a poem of, of, written by a father who had lost his son, and this person had, had, had felt something very deeply about his own son during our performance. Those kinds of things actually are infinitely more meaningful in an immediate, like you said, uh, you know, personal way. Um, than 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 awards that are kind of on a, a more general big level. When you see when you see somebody in front of you who you've connected with, and who's connecting right back with you, that's really everything, you know. Yeah, absolutely. One, one connection like that is is enough for a lifetime in a way. Without a doubt. Yeah. Without a doubt. You know, the one yeah. thing too is you've had incredible range in your career from different cultures that you've pulled from, whether it's the traditions of Africa or, you know, your home country of, of Israel or New Orleans and all these influences in these musicians from Mike Stern to Wycliffe Jean. What, at the end of the day, what kind of conversation are you wanting to have on stage when you're communicating the universal language of music? How do you want your conversation to take place? Well, I want to be myself. So I think, um, you know, when I first started, you know, when I, I've worked with a lot with West African musicians, for example, and I think I'm lucky in the sense that that I was playing the clarinet and the sax and stuff that are not common instruments in Mali music, because I wasn't able to just fit into a specific role. So I had to find my own voice within that music, and that's how, how I like to approach any collaboration I do and, and any any playing with any musicians is is to be myself and to to just express myself within the context of, of listening to them and, and playing with them, as opposed to trying to, you know, play a specific role in the music that's already prescribed. So, um, you know, like in the case of the West African stuff, I, I had to start imagining that I was a djembe and playing like a djembe, and then imagining I was a kora with the harp from West Africa, or imagining I was a griot singer, the way that they sing, and then, that let that kind of push me, push me to explore different ways to play my instrument, but at the end of the day, just be myself. And a little bit of Louis Armstrong comes out, a little bit of Plesmer might come out, you know, West African rhythms might come out. Whatever comes out comes out, but it's at the end of the day, it's all through a filter of of who I am. At this point in your life, in your career, when you look back, how do you feel about how everything's turned out? I mean, it's good. I, I I'm I'm excited for the future. You know, I'm always kind of looking forward. I feel very, very good about all the opportunities that are ahead and and uh, and everything that 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 I have done. I mean, definitely, it's a lot. You know, a lot of work to make each thing come to fruition. Um, but yeah, I feel great about things. So you know, of all the jazz heroes or the jazz albums and the influences you've had over your life, let's whittle this list down here. And you. Get a hop into that Back to the Future DeLorean. You get a punch in the digits, and you can go anywhere and see a jazz performance. Who are you going to go see, and where are you going to see it? Oof. Can I just make one trip? <laughs> no, no, no. You can you can make some stops. That's not It could be a journey. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I mean, the, the first thing I, w- I would go to check out is New Orleans before 1917, before Storyville closed down, um, you know, a period where we don't have any recordings from that time. And that was really when, when, uh, when this music that we now call jazz was was just starting up. Um, one thing we do on our uh, on the Reimagining Benny Goodman album is we play a version of Jelly Roll Morton King Porter Stomp, which was written in 1905. In 1905 in New Orleans, you know, Louis Armstrong was four years old. 
it was 12 years before people start, you know, this mass migration out of New Orleans up to Chicago and, you know, what we now call jazz is spreading. So I, you know, I'm just super curious to see what the music was like then and what the atmosphere was like. What, what was the life that was inspiring this music to happen? And all kinds of, you know, I, I've always been super curious about, about this, this, period of the beginnings of, of, of what, you know, what we call jazz, what we call the blues and stuff like that. I mean, you know, the, the first recordings of the blues are not what we usually think of the blues as, you know, somebody, the traditional kind of image of the blues is, is, is you know, a male playing guitar singing. But the first recordings of the blues were female fronting a large band singing a song that she, that she didn't write. So, and if you go back to like these these like Mississippi Shakes, uh, a string band uh, that was that only recorded under blues titles, but they're they were playing a lot of of you know the the, the crossing of racial boundaries at the time was happening a lot more I think from from what I understand than uh, what the what the record labels were the record labels kind of you know, put things into boxes of this is black music, this is white music. But that whole time in, in the beginning of the, the, the 20th century really fascinates me about how, how this music was starting up and, and all the cross influences that were happening, you know, in New Orleans and Mississippi, in Texas and Dallas and, and, uh, all these, all these places in Georgia with Blind Willie Mactel. That, that really, I would love to just have been there. Just be the beginning of the journey. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where else would you go after that? I mean, I, I would, I would, you know, 52nd Street when it was when it was hopping, yeah. and you had, you know, Miles and Dizzy and and Bird going to see Machito. It, it really all these all these places where people are colliding and, and cultures are colliding and 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 sharing the music with each other. That's really really fascinating to me that's new orleans that's new york that's all these places where it's where there's a dense a density of musicians together well the, the birth of this question to me was being down here in kcmo on 18 and vine and looking up and just thinking about you know if i could go back in fact at one point robert yeah. Roman came he came here in 95 and kind of dolled up an area down there to film and he had a lot of props down there and i could kind of see what it would look like and you know it was the paris of the plains it, there was you know, bootlegging going on. Pendergast had this town hopping, and everybody was playing. And mm -hmm. I just, I, that kind of exploded that dreamland in my brain. But uh, yeah. let, let me let me ask you this: a generic question, but why do you love jazz? I love music, and that tradition that that, that we call jazz is a tradition that I happen to have grown up into. If I were born somewhere else and and grew up into a tradition of, you know. Chinese opera or whatever, I'm sure I would fall in love with that music. But I feel like, you know, jazz is is, is the tradition that, you know, when I moved here when I was four, I, I, I grew up in this country. I I ended up falling in love with, with jazz and, and the depth of that tradition is just so beautiful to me. And, uh, you know, going from Louis Armstrong up till all the stuff that's happening today, there's like a, a real lineage. And knowing that that you're a part of that lineage, uh, to me is really, really, uh, provides some kind of continuity that where you're conversing with, with the past and with the future and the present. And of course, you know, in this music, there's so much freedom to be yourself. Yeah. Um, and you get that freedom, I think, by understanding where you are in, in this, you, you get that freedom by loving the, the music of, of others. You know, I love the music of of, uh, of Louis Armstrong, like just like I love the music, you know, of a lot of people who live right down the street from me. You know, yeah. Just yesterday, living here in New York, I was just yesterday I was li listening to a friend play and, and loving it, and being part of that tradition that's moving forward. Then you can just be yourself, and I think that's one thing that I really love about jazz too is that it allows you to bring your own voice in such a such a, a great way. 
So let's get to the man behind the voice here. This is my final question for you. Everyone has mm-hmm. a version of who you are. You know, your family have a, has a version, your friends, the fans you play for, business associates. But when you wake up and you face the world, who are you? Hmm. I think I, I, I would have a hard time communicating that with words. And the only way I can communicate that is really the, the best way that I've found to communicate who I am is, is through music. Yeah. I think that's that's it. That's profound right there. Thank you for opening up, giving me your story, and giving me your time, and, and most assuredly for your music. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much. I really appreciate all you're doing, uh, you know, spreading this music and continuing the love for it. It's, it's wonderful. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Oran for his time, his honesty, and all of that great jazz music and education. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store or visit the Neon Jazz YouTube channel. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.